You're watching Taking Stock on ENCA. We're talking to Owen and Cormo from Nkunzi Investments and Paul Teron from Vestac. Probably one of the biggest and most complicated and most, if you like, red braces stories of 2019. And when I say red braces, it really interests people in red braces. But actually, it's got a far bigger significance than just for investment bankers. And that is the unbundling by Remgro and by Rand Merchant Bank Investment Holdings of its stake in the First Rand Group. Uh, when the founders of First Rand started out, South Africa was a fertile hunting ground for foreigners wanting to buy local banks. So they set up these control structures and now are dismantling them, Paul, um, in a way that suggests that they feel quite safe, that we're not going to get Johnny Foreigner coming in and buying up our banks or not. Yeah, look, Johnny Foreigner buying local banks doesn't really happen anywhere in the world anymore because of the changes to banking regulation and those Basel capital adequacy rules. Which is Owning why minority Barclays, stakes Barclays, sort of came in, Barclays came in and then went out. And went out because they had to provide capital at the center for all of the uh, local businesses, even if you only own like a 30% stake. But I like the FNB group reorganization because what it tells you is that we're sort of maturing as an economy that it's appropriate that we have a shareholders own assets like that directly, that you don't need these control structures which engineer, you know, sort of a couple of shadowy individuals having control stakes. It's a bit of a more mature, in my opinion, and the reorganization has been very, very favorable for shareholders over a 10-year period. Mm, but banking shares have been quite interesting, though, and I mean, we've seen them all come off very, very sharply as the almost inevitable downgrade looms unless we see something of a miraculous turnaround and I think we've given up on miracles um, because banks can't have a higher credit rating than the sovereign rating and so at the moment banks are at risk of having that higher credit rating it's almost as if investors are giving up and capitulating and despite the fact that they're really good businesses that are run really well return give great returns and pay phenomenal dividends um, investors are setting down our banks yeah most definitely I mean it's the banking stocks and uh, to an extent any stock exposed to to credit or lending or you know the retail counters should a downgrade come through those stocks are obviously very vulnerable um, and I think already they are they are struggling from the fact that uh, the economy is not doing well there's not a whole lot of new big business going on out there to be funded um, you know the corporate finance guys I think they're sitting there twiddling their thumbs right now there's not a lot of uh, mergers and activities going on and the and the, and the consumer is uh, under a lot of pressure I mean there's a lot of people in debt out there that are managing trying to manage their debts and um, I think obviously for the banking sector if we were to get a downgrade it's it, it won't board well for the sector and I think uh, potentially the one company that continues to surprise Paul I don't know what you think but Cabitech continues to really do well in the now, sector. The, the, the two best performing companies in South Africa over the last five years, and I'm referring to the Sunday Times Top 100 Awards, they look at the best performing companies over a five-year period. The top two, Capitec, and the second one, Transaction Capital. People yep. know Transaction Capital for letting into the taxi industry. Exactly. But a big part of their business is debt collection. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's ironic, I suppose, that businesses that primarily serve the lower end of the pyramid are the ones that are flourishing and growing at 18, 20 percent a year yeah, in South Africa. Sometimes, you know, even in a tough environment, there's always someone who's gaining market share and someone who's losing it. So it could also just be a couple of tactical moves which turned out to be good ones, you know, acquisitions at a certain time. But you're right, transaction capital has continued to do really nicely. I've always been a bit scared of Capitex rating, which is very high. And I know that there are a few rumblings about PSG and its control stake in Capitec and whether that shouldn't come onto the market. But you do have to hand it to them. They've continuously, you know, traded well and, you know, avoided hitting some of the icebergs that their competitors like African mm. Bank back in the day hit. Yeah, but I mean, it's kind of tragic that those are the businesses that are the ones that are flourishing because they are um, uh, they're, they're, they're serving a community that is in trouble, financial trouble, deep financial you, you, distress. You know, I think, I think actually, uh, uh, potentially to the contrary, if you look at uh, Capitec and the way it's structured, the, the, some of the customers that they have are the most disciplined when it comes to paying credit. Because um, nobody else will give them credit. You know, they know uh, that this is the exactly, place that Exactly, they know that, I mean, I earn 5,000. I can only go and uh, ask for 1,500 rand from, from, from these guys. And they're able to pay it because their salaries come straight into the Capitec bank account. And, I mean, uh, we just started a new entity in the business. We hired about 10-odd people, young guys, 
that were grooming. I mean, all of those guys, I am not kidding, they all bank with Capitec. They say simple, it's sophisticated, the costs are low. And you know, for transaction capital, it's, uh, it's like a very dominant fund of the taxi industry. And I think as long as the government doesn't, um, doesn't you know, change the shape of public transport in the country, they will always have a very decent market to, 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 to sell their debt into. And they sell it at very exorbitant rates. It, 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 the thing is, it, with, in terms of government priorities, reforming the, <laughs> the, the public transport industry is, <laughs> is way down at that yeah. list of priorities. Tiger Brands has had probably its worst year in its history. Um, Listeriosis has not covered itself in glory. They've put their vamp business i love the name the vamp yeah. business value added meat products <laughs> um, which is the, the stuff that the, the, the vampires <laughs> won't the eat vampire. you, 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 you scoop it up you make your polonies and there's bacon meats. in there and you know we all like bacon <laughs> there we go. but i mean they, they're finally going to get rid of that because this is the albatross around the neck of tiger brands and once again this is a bit worrying looking north of our borders the last time they did that it didn't end well in terms of dangote and lots of other things i would imagine given the class action suit that's in process Process, although Tiger Brands is accused of being quite slow in terms of requiring extra information, that they'll only be able to sell that business if they uh, underwrite the eventual cost of whatever Any legal liabilities that come out. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know. Look, it's got, uh, you know, people are very fond of food. You know, <laughs> you may have heard that people consume food. Some cases three times a day, no. some people even more. <laughs> we should invest in those companies. Yeah. So, you know, I think Tiger Brands is going to be fine, and one can only hope that their African operations, which they have already in East and West Africa, that they're going to proceed cautiously. I mean, there's enough institutional memory there of what happened with the misadventures with Dangote flour mills and so on in Nigeria. I don't think they'll make those mistakes. Again. I was chatting to Pepco the other day, oh, and then uh, Pepco, as you know, now is finally withdrawing from Zimbabwe. They had 40 shops at one point. They cut it down to 20, and now by June next year, they will be out of Zimbabwe. And it's the first big capitulation by a South African corporate. South African corporates that have very courageously gone into markets that many other companies wouldn't serve, and any other corporations wouldn't serve, any countries wouldn't serve. Um, they went into Zim. They had a lot of faith in Zim for a long time. But even they, the mighty Pepcor, who the phrase is skrk for nix, um, have now got a fright in Zimbabwe. I mean, if you, if you go around Santon talking to the analysts, there is not one who's got a model that has faith and hope in their models. It doesn't work. You know, you just let the numbers speak. You let the uh, economy in the jurisdiction you want to invest in speak. There's a lot of com companies that went to invest in Nigeria, and, they and they've also been pulling out because the environment is just not conducive to some of the South African players, so they had to pull out. In the case of Zim, you know, many people had hoped that the country would turn around after President Mugabe was, uh, was taken off uh, uh, the leadership of that country. But it just looks more and more like we just changed one tire and put in a similar sized tire with some characteristics. So this car is just not going anywhere. And, and that's quite unfortunate for Pepco because... Uh, I suppose what's encouraging is they're not considering withdrawing from any other African markets, which from a continental point of view, from the free trade agreement point of view, from all of this vision for this continent, you know, 2030 and beyond, we need a highly functional cross-border trade system. We need other economies to be growing so that we've got markets for what we produce. Absolutely, we do, we do. But unfortunately, I think that uh, conversation around Africa really working as one singular continent, seeing things from the same place, is still another hundred years away. You know, that's why the colonial countries still dominate all over Africa. If you look at the Francophone countries, if you look at uh, even us and Zim, etc., the biggest guys that take money out of those countries are from our colonial co co companies. And unfortunately, we're always going to be at the back, and China is doing what it wants with uh, Zambia, Kenya, etc. And I believe it's quite, uh, we're losing quite a lot of... Um, uh, leverage, in my view, as the years go by, which says to me, we will. It will take a long time for twenty-one to... twenty would be a good year. You know, twenty-one twenty. Years from 20 now, we, we have this show in twenty-one <laughs> nineteen, then we can see. Like, like, sleeping, <laughs> like Sleeping Beauty, we need to take a potion and wake up a hundred years from now. Um, I think they're being a little bit overly cynical. Certainly, the Bureau of Economic Research in Stellenbosch, for the first time in November in more than two years, registered a small improvement in business confidence. Is it an anomaly? Is there something else going on in the economy? Or is there a little bit of life coming through that may very well support not only some of South Africa's biggest companies, some very smart operators working in those companies, but also get a bit of growth going into this economy to get the jobs going, to get the economy growing, to get it into a sustainable future? More on that as we wrap up this edition of Taking Stock.